Excited to welcome you to the Whitehead Files Windrush 75 special. It's celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Windrush that arrived at Tilbury Docks on the 22nd of June 1948. This episode is supported by Red Willow Brewery and the Portico Library and it's called Standing on the Shoulders of Giants and I'm delighted to introduce Sir Jeff Palmer. So Jeff, are you there? Knock, knock. Yes, I am now. Yeah. <laughs> all, all the way from, is it Edinburgh you are? Yes, I'm just uh, outside Edinburgh, but Edinburgh would be good enough. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, I'm just south of Edinburgh, 10 miles. That's... But it's Edinburgh, both good. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I know your schedule is hugely busy and it's very very busy at this time of year as well mm. i've just said that you um you came over as a young boy um you're part of the windrush generation but you did yeah. on that said ship tell us about your um your journey over to the uk well um my mother came in 1951 and um and she came to work in london and as usual, she, you know, um, she sent back money to her sisters to look after me. We've got so a picture, let, a picture but, of your mom. Yes, that's my mom. Yes, I, I recognize her. Um, uh, and she came over in 1951. Um, and she had a very tough time because she told us that she couldn't get anywhere to live. She had to live at the Salvation Army and she couldn't get a job even though she was a dressmaker. Mm -hmm. uh, she got a job at the post office um, sorting mailbags, but she worked and she sent money back to look after me and my younger brother. Yeah. And then she sent money for me to join her here in 1955. So she came in 51, I came in 55. Right, okay. Um, Four years without your mom. Well, th that's right. But, you know, a lot of people who were born in this country were a lot younger than us. Mm. Um, um, underestimate the Windrush people. We didn't know the word trauma and we didn't know the word um, in emotion. We were coming here to work, to better ourselves. Yeah. And thus, any difficulties we had where we we dealt with them well my mum said that um you know you uh not so much you but your mom and and, and that generation um <coughs> excuse me they were invited over yeah um th th that um nobody invited my mother <laughs> i think <laughs> they wouldn't know where she was <laughs> so i think if there was an invitation it may have come to the government yeah but not to the ordinary people the ordinary people followed other people yeah yeah they knew somebody who was coming yeah um, and they then um they sort of imitated so a lot of it was imitation mm. and you came to london didn't you well um because there is a lot in between that because if you don't get that you really don't understand it in a sense mm. that my aunt got me my ticket because i was only 14 so mm. i couldn't have come on my own in terms of arranging and therefore my aunts got me ready that's my mom's sisters and that's an important part of our history yeah. mothers left their children with their grandparents or sisters or family so there was a trust there mm. and i got my ticket and before i left just as i was getting out my grand aunt called me over and wrapped my chest in newspaper 
because she was keeping me warm, thinking I didn't have a coat. Oh. And thus, that's the nature of the the people we're talking about. Mm. Um, and I put my shirt on and I left. And they took me to the airport. I flew to New York and got a ship in New York, the Ascania. My ah. mother came on the Mauritania. And these were Connard Line ships. Connard Line is still in Liverpool. Right. I, I went there the other day and I saw the office. Wow, did you? So I think, yes. They're still in Liverpool. Well, Connard Line is still a, a very big company. Mm. Um, and they own those ships. And I came on, as I said, the Ascania, came to Liverpool, got off, didn't know where Paddington was. I had to ask. And I got a train to Paddington to meet my mother in 1955. Not seen her since 1951. And she recognised me. I didn't recognise her. Mm -hmm. And she took me home to where she was living in one room in the attic um, in London. Yeah. So that's my arrival. That's your arrival. So, so I mean, you know, um, everyone remembers what month they arrived. What month of the year did you arrive in the UK? I arrived in March 1955. Do you know what? My mother arrived in March. Her birthday's in March and she was just right. not impressed at all. <laughs> well, you know, if you're brought up like I was in Jamaica, the only white person I know was the minister of the church. Yeah, yeah. The school, and I had no formal education other than what they call elementary. And you went to church three yeah. times every Sunday. Yeah. That was my education in Jamaica. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mum came across... Um, quite quite a few white people anyway because she was training as to be a hairdresser even though she came over and she became a nurse but she was mm -hmm. training as a hairdresser but she had her apprenticeship in one of the nice hotels okay so she would meet white people yeah but my family um you know i wouldn't i think if one or two of my aunts probably worked as domestic servants so they would have probably met white people but not in a a social capacity like going out yeah um, it, it it's the the minister of the church was the one that we knew very well and um and the picture we saw of your mom he was dressed to go to church i'm sure oh yes that's a, definitely a sunday morning because she wouldn't dress like that to go to work yeah yeah um, so the the habit of or the commitment of going to church was very, very strong. But yeah. as you may have heard with some of these Windrush programs, that when we went to church in, 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 uh, at that time, the churches didn't want us because you were driving their, no, their normal customers away. Because yes. the, the customers who normally, the white customers, did not like us there. And thus, some ministers told people like my mom and I that you, they would rather us not come back, and, and we didn't. When and we was, were. was that your first experience of racism? Well, you could call it racism. You see, again, the people who came from Jamaica like us in the 50s didn't know what racism was. We mm. never heard the, I've never heard the word. Mm. <laughs> so, again, you know, we are... It is tricky to put what I call modern interpretation of things onto yeah. the past. Uh, we regarded it as unpl unpleasant in a way, mm -hmm. but it was just something we had to deal with. Um, in fact, when somebody's being unpleasant to you, then you, you dealt with it. We didn't sit and said it was racism. No, I think leaving it till the 60s, you know, this is the 50s. In the 60s, when you cut to Enoch Powell and people like that, and mm. the term race and racism was being used. Yeah. Then we saw um, rejection like that as, mm. as, as, as racism, but not in the very early days. We saw it as really bad behavior. And you mentioned Enoch Powell for the for the viewers who, because uh, there's different age ranges, 
uh, mm -hmm. watching this for the viewers, Enoch Powell was a politician of the time in the 60s. Now, yeah. there, is, there is a document of somewhere um, of, of a newspaper article in the Gleaner mm -hmm. where Enoch Powell supports the migration of, of Commonwealth individuals to come to help mm -hmm. build the mother country. <laughs> that does exist. Well, yes, they they said that. Um, I've seen that where they said that he was a part of, um, you know, the, the government who were invited people uh, to come here. However, um, by, you know, the Labour Party um, had to respond to the fact that people were being treated badly in, in the 60s. Mm. And therefore, they brought in the first so-called race relation law yes uh, uh, and that was probably about 1963 mm -hmm. um, and that really is the official start of, of racism as such because the law then was involved yes and i think in 64 you had powell making that speech with the rivers of blood yes and talking about the black people are going to get the, the whip hand of white people. Mm -hmm. um, and then you had Griffith in Smithwick, mm. who was, and he talked about if you wanted um, a nigger for a neighbor, vote Labour. And, wow. that, and that was really working out now, mm. this aspect of, of race. Yeah. So we had that situation. Now, when I came, um, I came. I I was fourteen. Yeah. But my mom, my mom brought me here to work. I didn't come here to study. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, she, the, the next morning, the fourth of March, she was taking me to work. Yeah. She woke me up early, and uh, you know where the house she lived. Every room had a different family. Mm hmm. Um, you know, there were single rooms, as we call them. Mm. And that, um, that was very common. Oh, yeah, that was very common. But you could have three people living in one room. Mm. Um, and there was a sort of a collective kitchen on the landing. And there were probably sort of two bathrooms. Well, uh, that was, I, wasn't it, Sir Jeff? That was a survival because there were in the... Um, in the windows of of boarding houses and so on, you know, no no um, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. Which, yes, which that's, that's it. quite common. That's now become a sort of a, a cliche, in a yeah. sense that yeah. it wasn't in everyone. Mm. <laughs> it was you you would see it in some shops, um, but it wasn't that common. Mm. You know, we lived mainly in black people's houses. Yes. You know, we didn't live mainly in white people's houses. That's right. That's so, right. So <laughs> that, therefore, that notice mm. what was there, I've seen it, but it did not apply in general because mm. most black people lived in black people's owned houses. Mm -hmm. um, and that was very important because, as I said, when my mom came, she couldn't find anywhere to live. So, you know, I, 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 I don't mind, you know, the statements like that but it doesn't encapsulate the truth no that black people came and bought their own houses to accommodate their own people and if that didn't happen we would be in trouble yeah yeah uh, because we would have no place to live and you'll find that people from all over the caribbean you know my landlord the initial one was jamaican the second one was african and the third was um, St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, my mom lived in three different um, accommodations with three different landlords and none of them was white. Okay, so so, so, so at 14 you started working, but you- No, didn't. I didn't. No, no, wait. <laughs> oh, you didn't? Oh, you didn't? Oh, you didn't. I, I didn't start working. Pardon? Fourth of March, he took you to your first job. You said, "Well, I hadn't finished." <laughs> she she woke me up 
and she got me up and she gave me breakfast and it was then she told me I was going to work and therefore that came as a shock to me and the point is that but you don't argue again this is our culture you don't argue with parents children are supposed to be seen and not heard that's our colonial culture um it's probably quite different now but that's how it was then so you did i did what my mom said i got dressed and she took me down to, to the front door and when she was going out at half past seven there was a man at the door and the man said to my mother is that godfrey palmer my name isn't jeff and she said is that godfrey palmer the man said and my mom says yes he's my son he came yesterday and the man said, where are you going? And, he, and she said, we're going to work. And she got me a job in a milk shop, a local milk shop, mm -hmm. delivering sandwiches for workers in the Highbury, North London area. And mm -hmm. um, uh, it, 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 my mom says, yeah, but he cost me 86 pounds to bring him here. So, and I need him to help me work. And he said, he's got to go to school because he's not 15. I was 14 years and 11 months. <gasps> my birthday is 9th of April. Right. And this was the 4th of March, 1955. So I had to go to school. So she took me to the local school, but they rejected me. Now, this is the important part of the story in that it, 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 the school rejected me and said I was educationally subnormal. And then gave me a, a note to say I must go to the secondary modern school, which was not far away, which was in Nags Head, the area of North London. And, mm -hmm. and in terms of proximity, it was, we were between the women's prison in London, um, in North London, and the, not far from Pentonville prison where they executed people. So that's where we lived. And I went to the secondary modern school and the headmaster took me. But he didn't take me for just, uh, you know, a month. He took me for a term, fortunately. And it is that one term why I'm talking to you because I was good at cricket and picked, got picked to play for London after I was only here a couple of months. And that appeared in the Islington Gazette mm -hmm. that I was playing for London. Wow. Schoolboy cricketer, it was called it, the title of the article. And the local grammar school master, headmaster, had me, well, he talked with my headmaster at the secondary mod and had me transferred to the grammar school because he wanted a cricketer, not because of my academic potential or ability. And therefore, that is why i'm talking to you today yeah yeah so via your sporting prowess that's right and being transferred to the grammar school and be given a, an opportunity then to start mm -hmm. academic academic work but a lot of the other black kids were also transferred to um schools especially special schools um or rehabilitation centers because of what they regarded as bad behavior yeah. And, and like my brother, and they got into a lot of trouble. Yeah. In terms of the way this, they related with the society. And to think, um, if, if I can remember rightly, to think within 10 years of that, you made history. Well, well, history in a sense that I, I've managed to take the opportunities. In fact, um, I stayed at the grammar school for three years, from 55 to 58. Mm -hmm. And then I got a job at London University as a technician. And the professor helped me to get into university by giving me some time off and I got my A-levels. But even though I had my A-levels, I, I couldn't, no university would accept me because you were not an overseas student. Yes. You were an immigrant in the country applying from a local address. Yeah. So they weren't interested. Mm. Um, but Professor Chapman at Queen Elizabeth's College, where I worked, which was part of London University then, 
Mm -hmm. He helped me to get into Leicester University. So despite I had the qualifications, I needed help to get into university. So I got into Leicester mm -hmm. in 1961 and got an honours degree in botany by 1964. Do you know there's a lot to be said for allies? Oh, yes. Very important in a sense where you have it, they help inequality. They really, really do help us on our journey. That's so, right. so, um, so I alluded to you making history, and I, all I can think of is barley and abrasion, and you need to explain what that is. Well, what, what it is is that after I got my honours degree in botany, I went back to London and couldn't get a job. Um, I then. The only job was offered was when I, there were, I was offered two jobs, one in a betting shop with an honest degree in botany, and the other one was peeling potatoes in Beale's restaurant in London. So I peeled the potatoes because I thought it was close to botany, so I took that job. And I had two interviews for higher degrees, and one of them, where a very famous politician told me I should go go back to where I come from or go home and grow bananas. I did point out it was difficult to grow bananas in Haringey. And, and that was my sense of belonging because I was telling him that Jamaica has been part of the British setup or English stroke British since 1655. Mm. And this was the mother country and I'm going nowhere. Yes. So that I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't get the position, but then another in position came up in Edinburgh at the Harriet Water University. Ah. It, was a, it was a college then, and uh, I was taken by a, one of the professors, Professor Anna McLeod, to study for a PhD in cereals in Bali. <gasps> um, and that's how I started my Bali research for a PhD in the Harriet Watt College in 1964, December. So I started my research in 65, January, and I got my PhD in 67. And I left the Harriet Watt and worked at a research institute in Surrey from 1968 um, until 1977. Mm -hmm. And it was there at the Harriet Watt and the Research Institute that I did my research where um, a lot of the work I've done, some of it is published in Nature. That means it's very original. Mm -hmm. um, and that work clarified a lot of the mechanisms of how the grain works, sort of biochemically or physiologically. And I used that information to develop the barley abrasion process, which is a process which speeded up the malting process. It makes the grain malt faster. And big companies like Bass Charrington's, um, um, Allied Breweries, based in Burton-on-Trent, and the malt that was made by was used by breweries, some of them probably in Manchester. That you had. Mansfield Brewery there and Boddington's. Mm -hmm. so, oh, I knew the Mansfield family and I knew the Boddington family. Wow. So, um, were, Guinness, were Guinness involved as well? Did Guinness... Um... Well, yes. Well, when I was at the Harriet Watt <clears throat> in the 1980s, um, when I was then teaching and having students, both undergraduates and postgraduates, the Guinness Company asked me to go to Nigeria for them because they have a lot of big companies, a lot of people don't realise this, have breweries in a lot of colonial countries. So mm. Guinness had four breweries in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Heineken, Heineken had five. Um, and Heineken is now big in Manchester. And I know that. Yes, yes uh, it is. So um, I've also done consultancy work for Heineken. So yeah. that not with not just Guinness alone. You but, and I first met in 2018, um, mm -hmm. in connection with the Commonwealth, and our good, our mutual good friend Garth Dallas yes. introduced us. I know. Yeah. And um, 
and and you talking about um, sort of your experience in the in the industry because because I organise events and festivals and award ceremonies. But when I do a festival, I like to have um, a specific or a bespoke beer for that. You, you inspired me to do that. Uh, hence me um, every now and again doing what I call the uh, collaboration brew, getting people who wouldn't normally <laughs> brew a beer. Uh, I have a friendly brewery. Um, and this and this podcast is supported by Red Willow because uh, I bandy your name mm -hmm. about quite a lot. Um, so Red Willow okay. Brewery in Mansfield, family owned, Mansfield, Cheshire. And um, this is I Am Woman 2, mm -hmm. and uh, winging, winging its way to you in Scotland. Okay, thanks very much. But, 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 but what I'll do, I'll finish the Guinness story in Nigeria, because it's yeah, do, an do important Guinness story. way in fact we can use education. And this is an African whose ancestors were slaves, who, are now going, who is now going back to Nigeria to help which I think it's important to part of our heritage. Mm. We should not only help ourselves, but if we can help both here in Britain or abroad, then we should. So when Guinness asked me to go to Nigeria, I thought it was very important and I went. And the problem was the government had banned the import of European grain into Nigeria that meant the four breweries would have to shut down and those breweries were probably making more money for guinness than the brewery in ireland mm. so <clears throat> i went and to cut a long story short i suggested they use the local grain which is sorghum which is an african grain and they did and today that grain is now being used all over africa to brew european type beers and the local farmers are now doing very well because they now have large European breweries making European beer with African raw material. See, that's, that's and brilliant. That, and that has helped the, the farmers and the economy. And therefore, this is the, the man at the door who actually said I had to go to school. And therefore, to me, our society, it is critical that people make the judgment that is honest and right, rather than, and I'm talking about anybody, because I gave a talk once somewhere and somebody said, do you know what you're saying to us? Because if this were today, and your mother was asking to keep you not to go to to school but to go to you know to stay home because she wants you to go to work because she was poor she had no money yeah and therefore some people today would say just keep him at home for the month it's only a month yeah and therefore all the things that i've managed to do would not have been done with a misplaced sympathy so i'm i'm one for when there are rules, if they're wrong, you change them. But if they're there, you follow them. And I, the analogy I use, everybody has to stop at a red light. And you go on the green. Yeah. Amber, amber is a bit more, more tricky in terms yeah. of what you do. But I feel that in my life, the people that have helped me are, are very important. Yeah. And I just think that we cannot change the past. No. But we can change consequences, such as racism for the better and prejudice for that, the better using that, education. That's beautiful, Sir Jeff. Thank you. Um, before we wrap up, I mm -hmm. want to bring you right back to the present. So, um, 10 individuals went to London. Mm -hmm. One of the individuals was from Scotland. That mm -hmm. Tell us about this portrait and some exciting news. Right. It's um, well, I got a call from the BBC some time ago saying they wanted to come to my house in, in Scotland. And also they were bringing an artist with them. And the artist was, I didn't know who the artist was, but I agreed. And when they all arrived, 
um, the the artist was from America and he was black, um, and um, he had never been to the UK before, but he did some sketches and the BBC filmed, and that film will be shown, I think, on the twenty second nationally, um, and um, the artist did his sketches and then i was told that the portrait from this from these sketches which he did is part of a project of the of the king and that the 10 people were selected um <coughs> the windrush generation 10 people from the windrush generation were selected and that their 10 portraits will be shown on the 14th of June uh, <coughs> at Buckingham Palace. That's and I, I went down, I went down and I saw the 10 and they were, you know, the artists did a wonderful job on, on the paintings and those paintings will not be shown. Well, they will be shown in Edinburgh tomorrow morning um but they will be released on the 22nd to the general public windrush day it, it, that's windrush day so yeah. um it, the, the it, and you know there was a very large group of people in, in the in, in the in the palace invited from different sectors of our community and people like floella benjamin baroness benjamin was there mm -hmm. Len, mm, trevor phillips etc Mm -hmm. uh, they were all there look, looking and, and Maurice Stewart, the past announcer, news reader, she, she was there. So we had the Archbishop of Canterbury, it was a wide group. Yeah. Politicians, public figures were there. And, and I think it was, you know, a lot of people are sort of, you know, whether they like it or not. I think the other nine people are people who served this country yeah and um and i think it was wonderful that they were recognized um in this way some were over 90. um you know i'm 83 so i was just a youngster in compared with some of them and yeah. i think it, it was a great thing and and, and there'll be video will be released and the, the portraits will be released and i just think that i hope the government continues and the public to recognize the the effort that people put into many many of them of course have died yeah um, but they ran the tubes they ran the, the buses and they worked in what we call factories yeah um to make you know goods for wholesome goods etc so you know it's a very important month this to yeah. recognize people who thought they were going back home yeah <laughs> because they came to work to go back home but m most of them did not go back home they stayed yeah and their children are here well, well, I well I, I'm, a product, I'm a product of um of uh, you know of people who came came over and right. made many many sacrifices is. can i just wrap up and say no thank, thank you so much um sir jeffrey palmer this is part of the winter of 75 um special for the whitehead files i've called it standing on the shoulders of giants because my generation are standing on the shoulder of giants and that portrait that you've described is is spot on it's perfect thank you to the portico library and to the Red Willow Brewery as well for their support. Um, this is Carolyn Whitehead for Thank the Wiles. Thanking Sir Jeff Palmer, signing off. Thank you very much.